Contested Bones, Part 5. We've been discussing the book Contested Bones by Christopher Roop and John Sanford, um, which is available at contestedbones.org. Um, and the cover looks like that. Um, there's uh, photos of Christopher Roop and John Sanford. Uh, Christopher Oops done probably most of the work, but John Sanford is the is the driving force behind, as it mentions in the prologue. You'll notice that John Sanford was actually an evolutionist until about the age of fifty, when he realized two things: the one, the impotence of evolution to actually do what it's supposed to do, and two, the impact of genetic entropy, which means that we're actually sliding backwards or downwards, or however you want to put it. And then he had. Once you had that, you have a strong argument for creation. And then he had cognitive dissonance with all the fossil evidence of man evolving from apes and so set about to investigate it, as a good scientist would. And uh, he got Chris Roop to help him in his investigation and the book is the result of their um, investigation. Chapter one discusses the advancing apes icon, the famous ape to man sequence, the evolutionary story, scientific method, and taxonomic principles, setting the stage for the rest. Th uh, chapter two gives you an overview given those principles of the textbook picture, which is straight line evolution, which is why the ape to man thing was so popular. It fit into evolutionary theory. The field is now widely acknowledged to be more bush-like and some state that the ascent of man cannot be traced, which raises the question, did it even happen? Almost all of the fossils, in fact, are contested. Now, chapter three, we got down to brass tacks, Neanderthals are humans. Chapter four, Homo erectus is humans. And of course that has implications if Homo erectus is human and somebody says, well, Flores is a branch of Homo erectus. Well, that kind of leaves Homo uh, fl uh, Flores man as human as well. But now they're going to deal directly with Homo floresiensis. Is Hobbit a new species is the subtitle of the question. And the quote at the top is Flores LB1, which is the uh, Hobbit may represent a congenitally abnormal individual drawn from a small body population of Homo sapiens. That is, this is actually human. And uh, the abnormalities re results from founder effects, genetic isolation, and a high inbreeding coefficient. And that's the opinion of somebody from a university in South Africa. Discovery of Hobbit. In 2003, a, pa a team of paleoanthropologists led by Michael Morwood and Peter Brown were exploring a limestone cave known as Liangbua, which means cold cave, on the Indonesian island of Flores in Southeast Asia. To their surprise, they discovered a nearly complete skull and a partial skeleton, formerly designated LB1, uh, Liangbua 1. The skeleton included leg bones, hands, feet, a partial pelvis, and other fragmentary remains, which uh, was shown a bit. Um, a complete lower jaw bone was also found belonging to a second individual designated LB2. And there's the Liangbua, the cold cave. And you can see they've got people in there for scale and uh, some place where they've been digging and found this creature, whatever it is. The, the skull of LB1 was very small, figure three, maybe one third the size of an average human and had a cranial capacity of about 380 cubic centimeters. Later revised to 420 cubic centimeters. It's interesting how it got larger. 
their initial reaction was that it was a child. However, its fully emerged wisdom teeth, brow ridges, and other features suggested that it was a female adult, which stood about three feet, six inches tall. Brown thought it might be a disease, diseased human with some type of growth disorder, but soon decided it was a new species entirely, which is great because now uh, Brown and colleagues get to name this new species. The basis for naming it as a new species had to do with a combination of abnormal features such as small stature, tiny cranial capacity, short femur bones, disproportionately flat feet, and asymmetry of the facial features. Skull is asymmetric. In 2004, they reported in the journal Nature that they had discovered a new human species that lived 18,000 years ago based on carbon-14 dating of the surrounding limestone. The research is called the new species Homo floresiensis, but nicknamed it Hobbit because of her diminutive size. Now I think I may not have put in that picture. Shortly after a number of bones of at least eight other individuals were recovered from the same site. By 2009, this number increased to a total of 14 individuals, though LB1 remains the most complete skeleton recovered to date. The researchers were uncertain as to whether the hobbit was a modern offshoot of Homo erectus, Homo habilis, or even Australopithecus. Uh, Australopithecus. Despite its uncertain origin, the authors remain convinced it was a new species distinct from Homo sapiens. It's got to be, otherwise they lose their ability to name a new species. However, many other paleoanthropologists, including some members of the discovery team, adamantly insist that hobbit is not a new species but is fully human, homo sapiens. They cite evidence that these bones represent modern humans suffering from a complex of serious pathologies and that they lived no more than 3,000 to 4,000 years ago. How do you date that? Hmm. New species are a diseased modern human. Even now, intense debate continues to rage within the paleo community. Paleo expert Chris Stinger noted a decade after the discovery, controversy about this species continues to this day, including whether it belongs in Homo. Scientific American published an article at the same time called, titled Human or Hobbit. The arguments over an ancient skeleton just won't die. Paleo researchers described the two competing views in the Academy of Sciences. Uh, from the beginning, two schools of thought prevailed. And this situation pers persists today. One purports that the Ling Bua human, human series belongs to a local modern human, Homo sapiens sapiens, with anatomical peculiarities or pathologies that may be due to insular isolation or endogamy. The second argues in favor of the existence of a new species that, depending on the authors, is either a descendant of the local Homo erectus or belongs to a much more basal taxon, closer to our archaic Homo or to Australopithecines. The paleo experts who insist the Flores hobbits is a legitimate new species distinct from humans originally claimed the hominin was present on the island of Flores as, as early as 92,000 years ago and disappeared 12,000 years ago. However, a more recent study published in Nature offered a revised time span from 190,000 to 50,000 years ago. Now you can tell that these uh, dates are all completely objective. Uh, Possibly surviving long after, this paper indicates the hobbit may have lived alongside Homo sapiens who arrived on the island between 55,000 and 35,000 years ago. A separate 2016 study reported additional fossil findings suggest that the hobbit might have lived on the island much earlier, 700,000 years ago. Anybody for a million? Um, <clears throat> So at this point, the age for these bones could range anywhere from 1,000 to 1 million years old. Whatever its age, proponents of the new species hypothesis regard the hobbit as a miniaturized descendant of Erectus that arrived on the island perhaps 1 million years ago. Some would even consider the idea that a hobbit evolved directly from Australopithecus, not going through Homo erectus even. To support their view, these researchers claim the hobbit displays an evolutionary mosaic of Australopithecus and Homo traits. However, many other leading paleo experts reject these dates and completely reject the new species designation. So you can quote somebody to support just about any position you like. Instead, they highlight a number of skeletal features shared by modern pygmy Homo sapiens population that actually still lives in the neighborhood of the cave. Leading evolutionary paleo experts, including Alan Thorne, Bob Eckhart, Tuku Jacob, 
Monsieur Hennenberg and others have reported this in the proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. If this population, Homo floresiensis, had been isolated genetically up until the very recent past, how can identical anatomical features be shared by members of the putative new taxon and subsequent Homo sapiens, that is, the Rampasasa pygmies that live near Lingbua Cave? Oh, live right there near the cave, be explained. Alternatively, if contact and interbreeding did occur, how could separate species status for Homo floresiensis be justified? Interestingly, the paleo experts who named Hobbit as a new human species, Morwood Brown and colleagues, never compared its skeletal features to the very small human beings who now populate that region of the island. These researchers, wait a minute, oh, these researchers must be the people who are criticizing them, explained that if they had done so, they would have noticed the obvious similarities to the modern Rampasasa pygmies who live close to the cave. Instead, comparisons were made with modern humans from other parts of the world, primarily Europe. Now, there are the Rampasasa pygmies. In case you are interested, that's 150 centimeters, which is a tad over four feet, 11 inches. So that's what, about 4'10", something like that. And that's a male. The females are gonna be shorter. So, you know, there. Now, I want you to notice something about this. <clears throat> These are obviously subhuman. They really don't count. You see, if you turn here, you look and you see there's a chin. Okay, this guy doesn't got one. He's obviously subhuman, right? Wait a minute. What? How is he wearing a shirt? Sloping forehead? Yeah, maybe. I, I mean, you, you, do you see what, what these criteria are doing to us? Somehow I prefer that uh, prefer the uh, the Sabbath school song or Sunday school song, whichever you happen to be going to. Uh, you know, uh, in this case, Sabbath school. Uh, Jesus loves the little children, all the little children of the world. No. Yeah, yeah. So. This is, uh, if you forgive me, I think this is complete demonstration that the people who are making those judgments are Eurocentric. Grossly Eurocentric. The people that live around the cave that are, I think, pretty much indisputably human. I, <laughs> you know, <laughs> they look like that. Why are we surprised if the ones that are buried in the ground look like that? These and other researchers liken the skeletal LB1 abnormalities, for example, the symmetry of the skull, to known human diseases. These paleo experts have insisted that a hobbit is a modern human who suffered, which suffered from microcephaly, which is a well-known developmental disorder that, off, that results in a misshapen skull with a reduced brain case. Other possible developmental disorders have also been suggested in the scientific literature, including cretinism, Laurent syndrome, and Down syndrome. Paleoanthropologist Amasius Hennenberg, the um, leading author of the paper published in the PNAS, explains, about two and a half years ago, it all clicked. I could see all the signs of the bones were compatible with Down syndrome. There are about 20 or so characteristics that are matching. There's not a single characteristic of LB1 that doesn't match. Well, that should settle it, I would think. In support of the disease modern human interpretation, they note in their paper that the skeletal features of the LB1 were not found in the skeletal remains belonging to the eight other individuals recovered from the dig site at that time. They criticized Brown and his team for basing their new species interpretation on a single partial skeleton. You know, I looked at this species and in every single case. <clears throat> as 
Specimen LB1 from Leung Bua Cave is unusual, but craniofacial and postcranial characteristics that are originally said to be diagnostic of the new species are not evident in the other more fragmentary skeletons in the sample that rem resemble other recent small-bodied human populations in the region, including the Andaman Islands, Palau, and Flores itself. So there's, I mean, there's, there's another, this happens in insular populations all the time. Other paleoanthropologists disagree with this interpretation and insist that the hobbit did not have any of the diseases mentioned above because Morewood and colleagues point out similarities in overall size and morphology between LB1 and the bones of other individuals found at Le Liangbua, but apparently there are differences too. For instance, the two jaws recovered from Liangbua both lacked the pro projecting chins, like the Rampasasa pygmies maybe. Uh, Brown and Morewood list chins as a distinguishing feature of Homo sapiens. Brown notes, you can't have a colony of microcephalics going through time. That's crazy. They claim that shared features among the other individuals are evidence that LB1 is not aberrant, but is instead representative of a long-term, morphologically unique, small-bodied population with configuration of features never recorded in normal or pathological Homo sapiens. These paleo experts argue that the pathology is an unconvincing explanation for the asymmetrical shape of the skull and other abnormal features. I want you to notice that it's always the skull. I haven't seen more than one skull yet. Jawbones, yes. Skulls, no. There is an embarrassing mistake made soon after the fossil remains were recovered. Tiku Jacob, head of, the, head of Indonesia's National Paleoanthropology Institute, insisted that his institute owned the fossil remains and took them to his own laboratory for further research. Apparently, while they were attempting to make molds, the fossils were damaged beyond repair. Brown explained that the unfossilized bones were like mush and could easily become a pile of mashed potato if they weren't treated carefully. As a paleoanthropologist, Peter Brown lamented, it is an outrage. It is now impossible for future scholars to verify my work. The pelvis was whole, now it is 100 crumbs. Pictures and measurements are all that is left for further study of the damaged bones. This, and uh, there's uh, another one of those mutations, this has made it difficult for researchers to discern whether the abnormalities of LB1 particularly the asymmetry of the skull, are legitimate anatomical features or simply recent damage of the bones. I'm sorry, and there is all you're gonna see of that skull. Because there's damage. But you can see, I think, that th there are pretty heavy brow ridges. It doesn't have much of a dome head. Um, the late Tiku Jacob, so he's now dead and you can't complain to him anymore, subsequently returned most of the remains except for the femur bones and portions of the rib that he sent to the Max Planck Institute for Evolutionary Anthropology in Germany where researchers were probing for intact DNA. If the fossil remains had yielded viable DNA that can be sequenced, it may resolve the status of Homo floresiensis flores once and for all. However, there have been no public, there has been, have been no publication, I think that's uh, an error in grammar, about Hobbit DNA to date, so the attempt must have been unsuccessful. I'm gonna skip over a little bit there. And the CAS scans reveal cognitively modern human brain. What can we gather from all this confusion? Is Hobbit a legitimate new hom hominin species or simply a unique people group belonging to the human race? As with Rectus and Naledi, the question is, is it human or just nearly human? An evaluation of cognitive capacities is one of the most informative lines of evidence to consider. If Hobbit shows evidence of the cre features of creativity, complex language, forethought, design, craftsmanship, and other advanced mental processes unique to modern man, it would be difficult to deny its humanity. In 2005, paleoneurologist, uh, and I see I didn't mark that that was my uh, ellipsis, 
uh, paleoneurologist Dean Falk and a group of evolutionary paleo experts published a paper in the journal Science describing LB1's brain shape. The shape of Hobbit's brain was digitally reconstructed by taking CT scans of the interior of the brain case. The researchers compared Hobbit's brain shape to that of chimpanzees Homo erectus, a modern woman, and a modern human who suffered from microcephaly. Their comparative analysis revealed that Hobbit looked most similar to Homo erectus, only smaller. And of course, we studied Homo erectus last time and raised the question, is it human with the suggested answer? Probably yes. Since erectus has been recognized by paleoanthropologists as having advanced cognition, this came as a surprise to the researchers. Falk was stunned to find distinct temporal lobes that reveal Hobbit's cognition was just as advanced as modern humans. In describing the endocast results in, his, in her book, The Fossil Chronicles, Falk writes, it was clear to us that the wide temporal lobes, lobes of Hobbit were a feature that was evolutionary advanced towards the human condition, which was unexpected, even unprecedented, in such a small brain. Falk and her team found evidence of an organ known as Brodmann's area, 10, or the frontal polar con uh, cortex. It is a region of the brain activated during numerous cognitive tasks such as multitasking, devising plans, making judgment, recalling specific events, imagining future events, daydreaming, and switching between what's called internally generated thoughts and those stimulated by external events. The expanded BA10 region, as well as other features shown by the endocast scans, suggest that Hobbit was capable of advanced mental processes typical of modern man. As Falk concludes, these regions are especially important for higher cognition in modern humans, and it's a good guess that they were for hobbits too. It is evident that a hobbit was capable of complex decision-making, reasoning, creativity, and even language. Corroborating evidence for this is based on advanced tools and artifacts found in the same strata as hobbits' remains at Liang Bua. Evolutionists have noted that the stone artifacts associated with hobbit exhibit a level of sophistication on par with those of human craftsmen. That was they could make all the, you know, standard stone tools that everybody else could make. Some of these sophisticated tools found by ex excavators included awls, microblades, carefully sharpened spearheads, large blades, other artifacts needed to hunt, transport, and butcher large animals living on the island, such as adult stegodons, dwarfed elephants, which weighed up to half a ton, the remains of which have been found at Ling Buda Cave. Geochronologist Geochron uh, and discovery team member Richard Roberts has noted that hunting and transporting large mammals must have involved coordinated group activity requiring language. The mounting evidence that supports the fully human status of the hobbit is hard to ignore. Among the excavated remains were found charred bones and a circular hearth of stones, revealing controlled use of fire and cooking. Morwood writes in Nature, use of fire by hominins is indicated by charred bones and the clusters of reddened and recracked rocks. Hobbit sailed to the island of Flores. Another problem for those who have tried to argue that Hobbit was a pre-human species is Hobbit's arrival on the Flores Island, which was never accessible through a land bridge, even during the Ice Age when sea levels were lower. Citing Morwood et al. and so forth, um, Robert Denal, acknowledge this in Quaternary Science Review. The question of how Homo floresiensis or its uh, floresiensis or its predecessors arrived on Flores is an important one because Flores would have always have been an island that was at least 19 kilometers from other islands. It's over 10 miles, well over 10 miles. Um, on the Sunda Shelf, even when sea levels were over 100 meters lower than today, you can't get there except by sailing. How then did the ancestors of Hobbit arrive on the island of Flores? There are really only two possibilities, one of which seems unlikely. Paleoanthropologists have suggested the possibility that it arrived accidentally on natural rafts of vegetation that had been out, swept out to sea following a cyclone or tsunami. This is far-fetched because while it could happen to a stray individual, it would be extremely unlikely to transport a viable breeding population. You need at least two, one male and one female, and preferably a little more so that uh, you don't have instant inbreeding. The more reasonable alternative is that Hobbit arrived by sailing, as Dennett puts it, purposeful navigation. 
This has been suggested by a number of evolutionary paleoanthropologists who believe the ans ancestors of Hobbit were Homo erectus. Building and navigating boats would be clearly proved that both erectus and Hobbit were fully human. Transportation via a watercraft across a strait 19, of 19 kilometers against an ocean current is not as easy as it might sound. The underlying reason why some paleo experts have preferred the accidental tsunami rafting interpretation, this is rich, is because the no of the notion that a hobbit was too primitive, lack lacking the mental prowess necessary for sailing. As evolutionary human origins offer Christopher Seddon writes, the construction of a suitable watercraft and the navigational skills required to make a voyage across the open sea are generally accepted to have been beyond the abilities of early humans. So they couldn't have done it, therefore they must have rafted. Love the reason, uh, reasoning. The assumption that a hobbit's ancestors were incapable of sailing is based on an evolutionary presupposition, ignoring actual evidence. Putting preconceptions aside and considering the evidence at face value, into cast scans, stone tools, artifacts, etc., everything we can reasonably infer about the Flores hobbits suggests they were fully human. The other skeletal abnormalities, such as reduced chins, can be found in other people groups, including the nearby Rampasasa pygmies, or can otherwise be explained by a process known as insular dwarfism. And the island dwarfing hypothesis, insular dwarfism is a well-documented phenomenon. Mammals living on an island can become smaller over generations. This is typically seen in island-dwelling species with access to a limited food supply. Such dwarfed populations are reproductively isolated, genetically isolated for many generations, and must survive for long periods undernourished and in very small populations. Under these conditions, genetic inbreeding occurs, as well as selection for reduced body size and brain volume. See chapter four, we, which we saw earlier. Deleterious mutations accumulate in the population and drift to fixation, causing changes in skeletal proportions and various other malformations. An example of this is an endangered population of pygmy elephants living on the Southeast Asian island of Borneo. They're genetically distinct, smaller in size, about two meters tall, so just, and rounder in shape compared to their mainland ancestors in Asia, figure four, which we'll, we will see in a little bit here. Historical records and long-held beliefs among the locals suggest the Borneo elephants originated from Java. A National Geographic article tells of an ancient Javanese ruler who sent elephants to the Sultan of Sulu as a gift. So we have historical records saying what happened. While diminutive elephants no longer inhabit the islands of Java, apparently some of them got imported to Borneo, the fossil remains can still be found. Excavations at Liang Bua, the cave where the hobbit was discovered, revealed the ev remains of butchered stegodons, a dwarf, dwarf elephant species. The fossil remains of other dwarfed elephants no, longer, no larger than one meter in height, we're talking really short elephants, um, have been found on, the other, on other islands such as Sicily, Malta, and Crete. Happens all the time. And this, uh, this pygmy stegma, stegodon is probably not a Borneo one, it's probably one of the smaller ones that, that you would have seen. Because the uh, Borneo elephants you could actually have a photo of. Since island dwarfing is well known among mammals, there's no reason why a small genetically isolated human population would not undergo the same kind of change. A number of paleo experts have suggested that this is the best explanation for the hobbit's diminutive size and unique traits. This includes Morwood himself, who is credited with being the driving force behind the hobbit discovery. He and the t his team first proposed the insular dwarfism hypothesis in their pa paper published in Nature, saying, if early hominin populations survived long-term on these islands, they would have been subject to the same insular speciation pressures evidence in Homo floresiensis. Or would advance this as a case for why Hobbit was so small, suggesting Hobbit was a pre-human species. However, the same process would obviously happen just as easily within Homo sapiens. In other words, it could happen for anybody. Similarly, Berger and colleagues provide evidence for ins insular dwarfism in their analysis of skeletal remains from Palau, Micronesia, that are only about 942,890 years old. In other words, clearly within human, normal human uh, habitation time. 
These bones are clear, uh, clearly belong to Homo sapiens and are described as small in body size even relative to uh, pygmoid populations from Southeast Asia and Indonesia, and thus may rec represent a marked case of human insular dwarfism. Skipping on a little further, other scientists have objected to the insular dwarfism hypothesis and insist it cannot count for the hobbit's disproportionately smaller brain size. Based on models of dwarfism, it is believed the brain size should, be, should scale downward in proportion to reduce body size. But Hobbit's cranial capacity is too small when scaled to equivalent body mass. However, Weston and Lister challenged the assumed scaling argument in the journal Nature. In a study on insular dwarfism in hippos, they noted that brain size reduce, reduction does not necessarily scale to body size. They report, here we show that the endocranial capacities of extinct dwarf species of hippopotamus from Madagascar are up to 30% smaller than those of a mainland African ancestor, scaled to equivalent body mass. As paleo researchers write in the Academy of Sciences, we also suggest abandoning the name Homo floresiensis to dis designate small Homo erectus, and we recommend putting Homo floresiensis in syn synonymy with Homo erectus, in other words, you're really looking at just small Homo erectus. And here's a little drawing they, somebody did, you know, uh, trying to put flesh on the bones. And, you know, when you get done, it doesn't look that uh, non-human. Uh, for comparison, we have one from a National Geographic, not in your book, by the way. Interesting to uh, see the contrast between the two. <coughs> you know, in one case you make it as uh, ape-like as you can. Conclusion, Hobbit was fully human. The Hobbit is still surrounded by controversy and dates for this skeleton are all over the map. However, it seems very clear that Hobbit is human, especially in consideration of the shared features among the Palauan bones and the Rampasasa pygmies living on the island of Flores. Their impressive cultural inventory, array of sophisticated stone tools, ability to sail the ocean open, and to cast scans revealing a modern human brain, and an overall modern human anatomy further confirms their fully human status. To explain their unique features, that is, asymmetry of the skull, flat-footedness, etc., paleo experts have offered a number of plausible explanations, uh, including pathologies seen in modern humans. Their small body size and reduced brain size are quite clearly due to island dwarfism, subsequent inbreeding, and reductive selection. Most paleo experts would classify Hobbit as either erectus or Homo sapiens. Since Homo erectus is recognized by numerous paleo experts as a variant of Homo sapiens, it is entirely reasonable to identify Hobbit as a variant of Homo sapiens, one of us. Notice when we get done, all of the stuff that we talked about so far is, in fact, uh, Homo sapiens. Now, in fall of 2007, there was a later development, and it's interesting to note that what had been written before basically presaged it. So they were clairvoyant, shall we say? As this book goes to press, a paper was published in Proceedings of the Royal Society B in June 2017. The findings of Jose Alexandre and colleagues is almost point for point confirmation of our assessment of Hobbit in this chapter. The researchers side with the splitters and maintain that Hobbit is a separate species, it depends on how you define things, yet they concluded from their complex com comprehensive, pardon me, complex quantitative genetic analysis that the Hobbit could be a dwarf descendant of Erectus, that is, Homo sapiens, from Indonesia. The researchers made the following points that were in remarkable agreement with our assessment, in, in addition to citing some of the same sources. One, Hobbit is a dwarf descendant of Erectus from Indonesia. Two, Hobbit's small body and brain size was subject to insular dwarfism. Three, Hobbit's small brain is explained by reductive selection. Four, reduced brain size would be advantageous in starvation conditions because it's energetically costly, the less you have it, the more or the less cost you have. Five, dwarf hippo fossils from Madagascar show how brain size can be reduced more than expected in relation to body size. And six, 
this process can occur relatively rapidly in small isolated populations. Skipping over the last little paragraph, the, uh, my take on this <coughs> is the chapter makes a convincing argument that Homo floresiensis is human. They seem to have human capabilities. One can use them as primitive humans with some ape-like features if one wants, but they're close enough to modern humans, they're close to modern humans and close enough to have been descended from them. Now, the argument for making hobbits non-human seems ill-conceived and against the evidence. It is against the evidence because they could in all probability create po powered watercraft and could definitely create stone tools. It seems ill-conceived Ill because by either, general by either general theory, they had to be de descended from Homo erectus or Homo sapiens. I, I think that a separate, uh, uh, separate evolution from uh, Australopithecus is really stretching. And thus, if the battle to separate erectus from humans is lost, hobbits really don't change anything. They go along for the ride. Remember the Bush theory of human evolution? The Bush theory of human evolution is okay, but we need to have a mainstream. Common descent requires that some population had continuous ancestor descendant relationship between apes and humans. That is mandatory. That's what common descent means. So you have to have some kind of a line. The traditional one, of course, is a straight line with chimpanzees perhaps changing slightly in the meantime. But you have to have a common line of descent. Now, it's probably more accurate to say that you have several common lines of descent that may have interweaved with each other. And, you know, the chimpanzees again stay about the same and there's some other branches that might come off earlier on. Then there's the Stephen Jay Gould kind of thing where suddenly uh, the center part is so fast that you don't find the fossilization. Um, but that's equivalent in terms of what you're going to find in the fossils to a brand new creation. Now, what you cannot have if you're using common descent again is the branch with two different trees with various things branching off on either side. Now, what we've looked at so far, okay, is Neanderthals, uh, pardon me, uh, you have to have, if, if you're in evolution, you have to have that somewhere, this kind of a, a uh, connecting line. If you don't have that, you don't have evolution, period. Now, maybe, Neanderthals belong here. Maybe they belong here. Um, maybe Homo erectus belongs there. Maybe Homo erectus belongs there. It looks like Flores man is related to Homo erectus somewhat. And then it goes there or it goes there. But certainly you could argue that they're all part of the same tree if you wanted to. And in fact, I think that's what is being maintained all the way along. That is, nobody really disputes most of what's being said here. Except that some people want to have them further down on the, on the uh, tree somewhere because we need to have these kind of fossils in here because they have to have been there. If they weren't there, we don't have common descent. If we don't have common descent between humans and apes, the whole explanatory tree for trying to explain uh, all of life without some kind of intelligent input really falls flat on its face. But that's my opinion. Now it's your turn. Go ahead. There is some evidence, uh, I, I believe in some Egypt, of molding of the uh, skulls purposely. Yeah, although to be fair with that, 
I mean, there's Flathead Indians in where my uh, where my mom grew up. You know, they deliberately put stuff on their head to make them flat uh, when they were kids and little kids. Uh, but they do have uh, brains that are the same size. They just mold to the uh, size of the skull. But uh, but in terms of the size, you don't you don't compress the size that much. So I would have to say that these things are small. You, one of the one of the minor things that came came by that that's of interest in this regard is that. The brain case went from 380 to 420. Yeah. And I think uh, one of the areas that I omitted was that somebody went inside and said, oh, there are rocks still in there and pulled them out <laughs> and all of a sudden there's a, you know, increase in the brain size. And I'm just going, your entire job was to get the brain, as, uh, get the skull as clean as reasonably possible. And you left rocks in there, and then you counted that as decreased brain size. You know, if that was a if that was a doctor, that would be malpractice. Somebody had rocks in their brains. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, I mean, the thing that really struck me uh, the image of the skull over the left eyebrow. There's like these waves of you know in, within the skull. It was really quite deformed. It wasn't just that it was asymmetric, it's, it's that I mean, it looks like pathology to me. Um, well, it's obviously a cross between human and Klingon. <laughs> right. <laughs> <clears throat> so, so I, you know, I googled images of, of skulls of, of um, you know, scurvy and, and inbreeding, trying to look at, you know, are, are there is it common for this sort of deformation, asymmetric deformation? And I, I really couldn't find anything. Uh, it strikes me as I don't know what to make of that, whether it's injury or, or what. But I don't, I don't think even inbreeding res would result in that. And it doesn't look like scurvy would either. You know, what would be much more comforting to me is if they had a line of 10 skulls and you could say, yeah, and they all had that, or that's the only one that did, and maybe it was abnormal. That's, that's the thing that strikes me. We are, we are reading two tea leaves, you know? <clears throat> my, my thought is even if you have just a single skull, it doesn't look like what what we see with with uh, with inbreeding or Down syndrome. I looked at Down syndrome as well. Down syndrome skulls are you know they have different shapes, but they're they're not asymmetric. Well, what I yeah, what I would like to see is rather than people uh, and and probably you can get this if you actually read the articles themselves to say oh it looks like Down syndrome to say. I, these measurements on the skull are the differences one would expect to find in Down syndrome, and the measurement here is you know so many centimeters, and uh, that compares with what you'd expect, and so forth. I'd like to, I'd like to see somebody you know really argue it in detail, but I'd also like to see whoever's doing the argument not to use Europeans as the sine qua non, you know. I mean that. That has implications if you go to the San Bushman in uh, South Africa. You're going to say they're not human? Give me a break. You know. Um, I'd like to expand a little bit on what it's just said. Um, when you look at the various diseases that can happen to humans, um, none of None of them fit precisely what we're seeing here. Now, there's another issue with 14 individuals, purported 14 individuals in this one cave. Are they a breeding colony? And do you have diseased individuals, male and female, that copulate 
and produce offspring that also have the same genetic disease. I don't know, we have physicians here, I don't know that microcephaly people get married and have offspring. So there's an issue of how were they able to produce that many individuals. Well, for one thing... I know we can come up with all kinds of speculations. For, for one thing, I can't, make a, I can't make a whole creature out of a jaw. And as far as I know, LB2 is a jaw, and that's it. I'm reading out of the book that um, they've found a number of bones of at least eight other individuals, possibly a total of 14 individuals. So we got at least eight, so that's a breeding yeah. colony, right? But, but again, you want to ask yourself, which bones? So you're discounting is, is it that three there's femurs and then, and then, you know. You're discounting that there were eight individuals. No, obviously. I'm not discounting that there were eight individuals. I'm saying that you can't reconstruct a whole person from one bone yeah. without a lot of imagination. Well, that's very true. We all. I mean, if you had three femurs, you, you could say they're, you know, if they're both, uh, if they're all three left femurs, well, then obviously there were three individuals. Exactly. But, you know, where do you go from there? It's hard to say. And that's why I would love to have more than one skull, but I have never seen more than one skull. I have never read about one more than one skull. Maybe somebody who's done a little more reading on that than I have uh, can say there's one, but. They certainly aren't trumpeted. You really haven't answered my point quite. Was this a breeding colony, or was this just one or two or three aberrant individuals of one family? Well, there's, yeah, and, and there's, uh, there's an interesting comment. Supposing you only have, for hypothesis sake, only one skull. Let's supposing that you have uh, enough distinctive other people to say that there were 14 people because the bones don't over, you know, you can't, can't put them into less than that number of, uh, of individuals. What this could show is that you had a compassionate set of humans that took care of one of their own who was less mentally endowed than average, mm -hmm. uh, but who is not left for the stegodons to trample or something. Right. And what you could actually have is something that shows more human rather than less human behavior in the colony. Yeah, that would presuppose that you have some normal individuals as well as the abnormal. Yeah, and, and you have we to don't be have careful. that evidence well, yet. You have to be careful about the uh, about the evidence because I'm, a, I'm supposing that if you get uh, Rampasasa pygmies do not have a protruding chin, 93% of them, the chin goes back, as in the photo. That's obviously genetic, along and, with other changes. And so if you find a bunch of chins without, you know, without standard human chins, that does not mean that you're dealing with subhuman population. So, I guess the thing of it is, these are things that you can look at one way if you want to, you can look at another way you, if you want to. That's the problem. <laughs> but, it's really hard for me to make a, a, a strong argument that uh, they're they're not human, and especially if many of the features that are shared by this particular uh, species turn out to be Homo erectus type, uh, you know, a form. If they're if they're Homo erectus type form, and you're able to show that Homo erectus one could interbreed with humans and two uh, displayed human type intelligence. Um, I think you're stuck by saying that that human needs to encompass, encompass the entire population. Um, going a little different direction, 
do I understand right that Sanford and his companion conclude that these are pygmies and we don't have to invoke the microcephaly type of scenario? It seems like they're talking about two parallel scenarios. Is that correct, or are they going to come out in favor of uh, island dwarfism, the pygmy uh, hypothesis? Well, I, I think that if you were to push them on that, they would say that, they're, that island dwarfism could encompass some, and it's debatable as whether all, mm -hmm. uh, of the of the reduced cranial capacity, I mean, 380, yeah. even 420 or whatever it is cc's, is a pretty small brain. Yeah. Even for a pygmy, it's a small brain. <laughs> True. Um, so, you know, if I was if I'm trying to read the tea leaves, and I think they would read him pretty much the same way, um, I would say they're you're probably looking at an abnormal human in a cluster of pygmy population which is mm -hmm. uh, so that you have you have some of both going on that's that's the impression I get from Sanford too yeah. Anyone else? you know it's of interest that islands do very strange things to populations uh, they mentioned the hip pygmy hippopotamus in on Madagascar and the pygmy elephants in Malta and uh, various other islands. It turns out that there are also sometimes very large animals that live on islands, uh, particularly the reptiles. The world's largest, longest snake uh, is the reticulated python and it lives in, I've forgotten which island, but it's in one of the islands in in the Indonesian uh, group. Um, and so you see that getting very large. The elephant bird, the largest bird ever to live, lived on the island of Madagascar. Uh, and finally, of course, the island of Komodo in the Indonesian archipelago contains the largest monitor lizard in the world, the Komodo dragon, which uh, gets to be eight, nine feet long. Um, so, at the same time you see very small populations, you can see very large populations too. Um, but the elephants are well known to be pygmy elephants, you know. A meter high elephant, I mean that's like, that's almost dog size. Mm -hmm. uh, there are probably some St. Bernards that are pretty close to that size. Yeah, Maybe not weight. Yeah. Probably, probably they weigh more than Great Dane because they're probably rounder, but, but they're, you know, <laughs> see a little elephant charging through the, I mean, it's like. <laughs> <laughs> but you could get uh, dwarfism or gigantism from inbreeding. Yeah, either one. Yeah. But so, so some of it I think is probably due to, I, I mean, the Rampasasa pygmies that live there still today are, well, you saw the photo is like a meter and a half. That's, you know, just under five foot. That's a small human. But they're clearly human in spite of their lack of a chin. I don't think that has much to do with I, it. I wanted to comment on the 2017, was it June report? Fall, fall 2017. And it seems to support everything in this chapter, right? And that's why they added it. I'm surprised they didn't uh, add some new findings. The latest theory, <laughs> talk about theories that go in all directions. The latest theory is that this population is now homo habilis. And it's a side branch coming <coughs> all the way from Africa. I don't know if you've gone to the web and discovered that. The easiest place to find it, and I just found it yesterday searching the web, um, Wikipedia. Can, you know, you don't, you don't build a hypothesis on Wikipedia, but it's an avenue to recent sources. 
And, uh, and it is a good it, it is a good summary of conventional. It's business. a nice summary of what's out there, but then you've got to go to the primary documents. Yeah. Don't don't base anything on Wikipedia. I'm speaking now as a librarian and a researcher, but I was shocked that they say there's a movement against uh, associating with uh, Neanderthal man or even um, Erectus. Now the reason <laughs> Erectus is so popular is Erectus is already found in Indonesia and that's where they first found it and there's lots of evidence for Erectus in Indonesia <clears throat> and so it'd be a much less of a problem to, to get a little pop, uh, small micro population, right. microencephaly population. Do they give um, reasons why they don't like Erectus as, a, as the ancestor? Well, they're facing the obvious evidence of this whole chapter is that everything doesn't fit with <laughs> Neanderthal, the, the measurements and everything. But they're going back and looking at the wider face, the reduced forehead, a little bit of a sagittal crest, which makes it more ape-like, and some other features, and no one has paid much attention to the uh, Hebelist theory because it's so far-fetched. Yeah. And so when I read, I read Wikipedia, this whole field is in total disarray. Well, but I the, mean total disarray. Hobbless, uh, of all the things to pick to try to compare with, you can put anything into Hobbless. I mean, it's it's a yeah. very undefined, yeah, our a very undefined uh, thing. So you know, put it there, yeah, sure, sure it'll fit. Uh, <laughs> well, as a matter of fact, we're going to be looking at Homo habilis yeah, fairly soon. We need so. to keep this in mind and compare it with Florent, Floresiensis. Yeah. yeah. But uh, true, they're calling them all Homo. So that's. But that's a wide, wide group. Homo is extremely wide. Well, again, if you have a if you have a population that could inbreed, the reason for not calling it human becomes really sketchy. Um, uh, you know, Neanderthalensis is clearly human at this point because we can simply. Find the we have the, the DNA. Of inbreeding. We yeah, have DNA. DNA. Unfortunately, uh, Homo erectus uh, is mostly found in areas where uh, the temperature has been too hot to preserve a yeah. lot of DNA. And there's a certain amount of of the dinosaur blood effect. You know, they're just too old. We why even bother to look because you know it's gone. Um, and, and now I understand that we can get Canaanite DNA. It's not quite as much of a stretch to be able to get uh, DNA from uh, some other, you know, we may be able to get Homo erectus. If we get Homo erectus and it, and it shows that there's, it's largely human and that there's interchange between human, certain human populations and Homo erectus, I think we are kind of stuck with uh, saying that whole thing is human. Mm -hmm. And I think at that point, the argument that, it, that Homo floresiensis is not Homo erectus that's been reduced is going to be a really hard argument to sell. Yes, comment back here. Do we know yeah. the age? Can, just a minute, can we? Do, do we know the age from the skeleton and you know they they can guess the age of an animal through their teeth but I don't know if we can do that with humans well you can do it to a certain extent this particular skull had the wisdom teeth emerged so we know it was we, adult but we don't know uh, uh, I'm, I'm only five feet and I'm shorter I mean I was five one and three quarters, but I'm not that anymore. So maybe this is a really, you know, old person, and they and they were pygmy anyway. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, yeah. I just wondered because I didn't know about 
Well, th there are actually ways of, of guessing, and you have to be careful about you know, how good the guesses are. Um, uh, populations that ate food that had uh, a little grit in it will wear down their enamel. And so you, uh, you know, how much of that is age and how much is that of that is mm -hmm. they just ate coarser food can be debated, but that does give you some indication of time. And, you know, there are probably other uh, bone characteristics. I'm not a, a, an anatomical specialist, so I can't really say exactly how you would tell. But, you know, there's wear and tear of other joints as well, and, and depending on the person, uh, they might give you a clue as, you know, if you've gotten, if, if you're my age, the uh, cartilage in your uh, knees tends to be a bit thinner, you know. And for some of us, it tends to be a lot thinner because there's pathology involved. So uh, some of it's going to be kind of a gestalt, and you look at this, and you look at this, and but the, you know, but the hip joint uh, is perfectly good. Then you're going to say, well, maybe they just have arthritis elsewhere. Um, but if everything looks old, they're probably old. Good point. Um, I'm shrinking too, so <laughs> when you I guess when you reach a certain age. Um, I joke with my daughter, she's always been exactly my height, and I said, boy, you're still growing. Yeah. <laughs> she, she's over 40, and she's still growing. <laughs> I don't want to admit the obvious. Um, do you know if, I don't see it in this chapter, is there any discussion whether these might be juveniles or even children? And that would account for their smaller size. Well, like I say, the wisdom teeth being in does kind of limit it to a certain age. Oh, wisdom teeth. Good. Yeah. So they say it's. So we have some dental experts here. Good. <laughs> yeah, they come in at a particular age, and once they come okay. in, I mean, if they come in, then you know that they're at least that old. So. Uh, I mean, one could argue that maybe she had premature eruption of the wisdom teeth, but, you know, uh, at a certain point, you should just accept what it looks like and yeah. not, not fight it too hard. Okay, thanks. And I was wondering about the, the supposed age of the bones and if you're aware of any research on um, bone decomposition, is supposedly they're up to a million years old in wet conditions. Um, well, that's a, it's an interesting thing because, you know, the, the bones are described as being extremely fragile. Um, in, in other areas, I mean, you know, Homo erectus, the uh, uh, Dubois skull cap seems to be pretty tough, yeah. Yeah. Uh, even though it's in a, in a very similar climate, although maybe inside of the Lingua uh, environment, it uh, there might be more carbonate, mineral, uh, more alkaline material, which may might make the bones more fragile. So it's it's hard to say. If you get an acid environment, you tend to dissolve the minerals away, but you tend to leave the proteins intact, which is kind of interesting. Which is, of course, how uh, uh, Mary Schweitzer discovered that. Uh, there was still elastic tissue in the uh, in dinosaur bones. Uh, it might it might be interesting to to go to local graveyards in the area. I don't know if they've been able to dig well, up. They frown bones. on that activity yeah. well, without a permit. <laughs> it may involve some degree of secrecy, but <laughs> I, I would assume. I mean, if you could if you could dig up some bones that were that you knew were maybe a hundred years old. Uh, you would expect these bones to be really, really robust, given the fact that just a few miles away, there's bones of millions of years old that are still, uh, you know, uh, intact somewhat when you find them. I don't. It might be interesting to compare the condition. Yeah, uh, it's a very interesting question. I, I suspect that chemistry has a lot more to do with the uh, d with the uh, d degree of preservation of the bones than does. Uh, uh, than does actual age. 
and, I mean, the thing I find fascinating is, you know, if you want him to be uh, 5,000 years old, you can do that. If you want him to be 1 million years old, you can do that. You know, what age would you like, sir? <laughs> it, 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 kind of, it kind of makes one a little less comfortable about all of the assertions of we know exactly how old these bones are. And a problem with dating them with carbon-14 dating, as you know, that's a destructive method, and they don't want to do any more damage to the bones as that's already been done. So I doubt if they'll even try to do carbon-14 on the teeth, for example. Well, it'd be interesting to ask the question, did they actually try any of that? Because if they did, it should be somewhere in the literature. I haven't done a complete survey of the literature, obviously, um, but, uh, but that would be something to go through the references that are there and see if somebody has actually tried it. Is there a name for research malpractice? Is there a word for that? For what practice? Research malpractice. Oh. You, you use that term and I like that, but is there a... Is there a <laughs> Is there a word for that? Because it really is. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, bad science. It's, uh, yeah, well, most people just call it bad science. It, the difference between uh, medicine and science, and this is why medicine is so sensitive to that, is if somebody can show that you didn't do it right, and they can show that the person suffered harm because you didn't do it right, then that's worth something. They, you have the obligation to make them whole. Uh, whereas, if you happen to be in the middle of Greenland and you, and your your only job, t for 24 hours a day for like six months or whatever it is, is to take the cores out and say yes, there are. Uh, let me put it in my logbook. There are five layers in here, and then you come out and when you get to a historically datable layer, you're three layers, you're six layers off actually. But when you go back, you say, oh, yeah, we missed three. And I'm just going, you know, how much brains does it take to do this? Well, in Greenland, they have recovered a, uh, the uh, twin-engine uh, fighter. And it uh, has something like, uh, you know, what was it, 30,000 or 40,000 uh, Years it, wasn't, it, of, wasn't uh, that, it wasn't that high. It was, it was more uh, hundreds of, year, of, of layers. But anyway, but it had a, a whole bunch of layers, they, and they know the exact date of yeah, when that plane the, went the down. The planes landed in 1942. They dug them out in 1990 or something like that, in 1985. And so, you know, there should be like 40 layers, and there's, there were hundreds. Nobody. Yeah, over 200. Yeah. No, nobody bothered to count them. They, there were that many. Uh, and, and realizing that they were getting into the area, and uh, this should have been a layer per year. Well, what, it, what everybody I think now will say, you'll, you'll find, probably you can even find this in Wikipedia if you hunted hard enough, uh, is that towards the edge of the ice shelf, you do not get one layer per year. You get more. That they mean something, but they don't mean yearly in that area. Well, that raises the entire question. What if you're building something up at the beginning? Could you get more than one layer per year until it got big enough to where it created its own weather so that you no longer get, uh, uh, you know, multiple storms per year coming through, that you only, you know, you get summer deposition, winter deposition, and that's it. <coughs> So uh, even if you were to count down there, which my understanding is that you lose the layers after a little while, um, at about 2,000 years down, it gets really hard to count, and they quit doing it visually, and they start doing it by electrical activity, which depends on how high you turn up the gain, how many years you want. And if you want 60,000 years, we can give you 60,000 years, and if you want 200,000 years, we can give you 200,000 years. And about that point, I'm going, uh, there's a problem here, isn't there? 
you know, I don't like it when, well, I mean, if, 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 I, were, if I were running a, a human uh, test and somebody said, well, the potassium is uh, 5.3 by this method and it's 8.7 by this method and it's, you know, a one, uh, 5.9 by this method, I'm not sure I'd pay much attention to it anymore because it doesn't really tell you what you need to know. Um, and, and yet we sometimes get the feeling that these ages are as secure as laboratory tests that we do all the time. And apparently they're not. I just want to add to that. Uh, by simply broadening the, the narrowing the beam uh, of reflected light, because it, what they're going on basis of uh, you know, reflected dirt, dirt patterns in there, dust and so on. And if you get a peak and you count it a year and so on. Uh, but by adjusting the size of the beam, they were able to add twenty-five thousand years in Greenland. Uh, which is just the point you were making, of course. That, uh, uh, after after you, after a while, you ask, you know, just sit down a little. You get a million years if you want to, just to start counting dust particles. Uh, I think I, I would like to see something that's a little more reproducible, and that's a little less arguable from both sides. Uh, I would have to say that I couldn't prove that the hobbit wasn't a descendant of Homo habilis or Australopithecus or whatever. But I don't have any particular reason not to believe it isn't a descendant of uh, some set of humans that uh, uh, went east and some of them lost their chins. Um, there's still some over there that do that are actually most people would have to say are fully human. Um, and I think the people who don't, I, I wonder about their ideological commitments. Um, and the rampus has a pygmies, are you really going to say they're not human? You know? And if these things look like small rhombus hasapygmies, okay, so there was a smaller population, we take it for what it's worth and move on. Um, I, I don't see Flora's man as a major challenge <coughs> to a creationist scenario that says God made people in one group and he made various kinds of apes in other groups. That, at least that's how I, how I view it. Did they have extra long arms? Pardon? Did, it, did they have extra long arms at all? They had lo a little longer arms and uh, apparently a little shorter femurs if I read the thing. I see. Mm -hmm. um, Interesting. We don't understand exactly why that was. I mean, you know, it, I'm, I'm actually open to the idea that, uh, that maybe there are chimp human crosses. I'm just not sure that this population is good enough for, to sell me on that. Anyway, come back next time and we'll go, we will talk about Australopithecus afarensis. Lucy.